Welcome to Terence McSweeney, A Life, created by the students of Terence McSweeney Community College in Knocknaheeny. Episode 3, The Arrest. When McSweeney returned to his office at the City Hall, he had a busy schedule ahead of him. The headquarters of the municipal government was a busy place with all the various strands of the struggle, violent and non-violent, coalescing beneath its roof. McSweeney was supposed to have a 7pm sit-down with Liam Lynch, commandant of the IRA's Cork No. 2 Brigade, who had travelled into the city specially to see him. Then, he was supposed to meet with the council of his own No. 1 Brigade an hour later. His schedule was so tight it had been decided the best thing to do was to have his colleagues gather around his desk for the 8 o'clock meeting. Because of that itinerary, the corridors were now teeming with some of the most wanted men in the whole country. Even worse, and unbeknownst to Max Sweeney, officers from the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the more exclusive, secretive and older forerunner of the IRA, had also chosen to get together at the City Hall that evening. A decision motivated by the centrality of the location. It would play a crucial role in the denouement of the rest of the night and the remainder of his life. A British raid on the local mails at one point on the 9th of August gave them an indication of the possibility that some IRB officers would meet at the City Hall three days later. It was an accident of war which gave the intelligence officer of the British 6th Division at Cork a slight lead which he fully utilised. He had a stroke of luck and he made the most of it. I saw them, I did, I saw them, and I roared and roared. They're coming, they're coming, get Max Sweeney out, get him out, they'll kill him like they did, Thomas. Knowing a raid like this would happen one day, security measures were in place and the workings of the building changed to help anybody leave in a hurry. For the younger listeners, think of the City Hall as Hogwarts, with all its secret passages and hidden doors. Escape plans were put into action. In the room next to the Lord Mayor's office, a trapdoor in the ceiling led through a series of other trapdoors all the way to the roof. In one corridor, a door had been camouflaged into the wall to allow only those in the know to gain escape. On hearing the commotion, I looked out the window. I could see British troops running into the building. I knew I had to get out of the building. The last thing I needed was to get jailed on some trumped up charge. I had work to do. I went out to the corridor. There was a secret passageway. If I could get to that, I knew I'd be okay. Cornelius Harrington, personal secretary, saw the Lord Mayor on the landing, egress. Crucially, on this night, McSweeney had left the key to that door in his sister's house in Belgrave Place. I rushed upstairs to warn the Lord Mayor. Between the top of the stairs on my western side of the building and the Lord Mayor's suite on the other side was an open corridor about 60 yards long. Halfway on the stair there was a landing at, which was an entrance door to the balcony of the assembly hall. As I reached the end of the corridor I met Harry. He was standing by one of the escape passages. I've left a key to the door in my sister's house in Belgrave Place. Not a great day to do a thing like that. The soldiers have occupied the bottom floor and they are on the move. Come on.
They were met by a soldier. His rifle and fixed bayonet extended, shouting. Halt! Harrington acted straight away and acted without a second thought to try to distract the soldier by walking quickly towards the vestibule. The young soldier followed him. McSweeney headed straight for the back door. Lieutenant W.M. Gillick of the 2nd Hampshire's reported. I was sent to cover the rear of the building. When I got to the top of the wall, I saw some civilians coming out the back of the hall. We ran around the path and found them in a hut, a workshop place. There were 11 men in that hut. I sent the private back to the sergeant for some more men and put a guard over civilians in the hut. The Lord Mayor had made it no further than the area behind the city hall. He was now under arrest. When his fellow prisoners asked him what they should do now, they were heading to jail. He replied, Humber Street. It was an extreme reaction, but also a kind of inevitable one. Just the previous day, 11 Republican prisoners at Cork Jail had started refusing food to call attention to the fact that they were being held there indefinitely without trial. An hour and a half after the raid began, the British soldiers had sorted who they had captured. Those of no interest, or those who seemed of no interest, were released. Only a dozen men remained in custody, all now held inside the hot out back. Among them were McSweeney, his vice commandant, Sean O'Hegarty, Joseph O'Connor, quartermaster, Cork No. 1 Brigade, and Liam Lynch. By 10 o'clock that night, the first times of hunger hitting, McSweeney and his fellow captives were on the back of lorries en route to Victoria Barracks. It was quite a haul of elite prisoners, but the lack of an RIC officer in the raiding party meant that the British soldiers didn't even realise how many senior IRA figures they'd just arrested. Blinded by the fact of having the Lord Mayor, they ended up releasing the other 11, including the prize lynch, without charge just four days later. When McSweeney was being taken into formal custody by the military that night, Sergeant Major Bailey, the officer in charge of the detention facility, turned to McSweeney and said, Right, Sonny Jim, I need you to take off that fancy chain. The chain in question was, of course, his chain of office. From around his neck. I would rather die than part with it. The sergeant major said no more. McSweeney was taken to his cell. At Belgrade Place, the McSweeney sisters were worried when they heard about Terry's arrest. They had been here before, but this time it felt different. I remember Annie pacing the floor and cursing the British and swearing vengeance. But soon we had problems of our own to deal with. At midnight that night, Two military officers and a large body of men came to our house to raid it. I knew what they were looking for. They were sent for that letter. They wanted it for evidence against our brother, against our Terry. If that letter had been found, he would have been charged. Not with the charges that were proffered against him, but on being the leader of a conspiracy to murder policemen. As they searched our house, our home, very thoroughly that night to get evidence of his complicity in the murder of policemen. They did their best to manufacture it beforehand. They found nothing, but that did not stop what happened, did it? <laughs>